Hi, and happy Monday, everyone. We are coming to you live from our new year of In Search of Civility. My name is Kathy Grismeyer, and I'm here with my co-host, Kelly Packard, to help moderate today's discussion. Um, before we introduce our guests, I want to give a little bit of background about our podcast, In Search of Civility. This series is an innovative partnership between the Association of Idaho Cities and the Boise Metro Chamber. We started this series back in 2021. We have some of our original podcast founders on today's podcast, which is exciting. And we remain committed to discussing the challenges facing our state and our communities. Here at In Search of Civility, we believe that in the idea that the truth exists and that we it cannot be found without a sincere exchange of ideas Civility in our discourse, we believe, is necessary for the advancement and preservations of relationships, institutions, and society as a whole. To agree, one must first disagree and disagree well, listening actively to key stakeholders, giving your political opponents respect, the benefit of the doubt, engaging it with empathy and sympathy for their motives, ultimately civility gives us the opportunity for our own ideas and notions to change bringing improvements to our own lives and even society as a whole. We believe civil dialogue can affect great change, uh, which is why we strive to help these important conversations take place. And of course, these conversations would not be made possible without the help of our partners. So we want to offer a big thank you to Holly Troxel Law Firm, who is sponsoring our show. And we also want to thank our media partners as well, Idaho Ed News, the Idaho Statesman, the Idaho Press, and the Idaho Capital Sun. They provide us this platform so that we can engage with our audience um, and have this interactive conversation. So joining us today, we have three very special guests. And so I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, Kelly, who will provide a little bit more background about who our guests are. Thank you, Kathy. I am thrilled to introduce our guests. Um, we have three phenomenal guests, um, and I'm really excited because we have back two of our former co-hosts of In Search of Civility um, from the founding days, Luke Malik and Matt Erpelding, as well as a former guest, Brian Kane. And I'd like to start by introducing Brian. He was selected in July of 2022 to assume the role of executive director for the National Association of Attorneys General, which he took over in September of that same year. Brian jo joined NAAG from the Attorney General, General's Office, Idaho Attorney General's Office, where he served as Chief Deputy Attorney General, acting as a liaison between the Attorney General and state, local, and federal governments. He was with the Idaho Attorney General's Office for a little over 21 years and held three other positions within that office. Prior to joining the Idaho OAG, Brian was an associate of Hall, Farley, Oberecht, and Blanton. Brian received his bachelor's degree in political science and history from the University of Idaho and, and his legal degree from Lewis and Clark Law School. He also served in the United States Army for four years, the bulk of which was with the 1st Cavalry Division in Fort Hood, Texas. Welcome, Brian, and thank you for your service. Next, Matt Erpelding is the Director of Business Development at One Stone, a Boise-based 501c3. It's a student-driven program committed to making students better leaders and arming them to do good. He is the former House Democratic leader in the Idaho legislature, formerly representing District 19. He was known for crossing the aisle to ensure that quality policies that benefited Idahoans were advanced and ultimately passed. A retired high altitude climbing guide, he has been in the outdoor industry for nearly 30 years. He has taught as an adjunct faculty member of Boise State University and College of Western Idaho. He is a graduate of Idaho State University and the University of Idaho, and is the proud parent of a five-year-old little daughter, Louise. Welcome, Matt, glad to have you back. And our final guest, um, Luke Malik, is a founding attorney and co-owner at Smith Malik Law Firm. He practices in the areas of business, healthcare, and municipal law, including transactions and litigation. He strives to make the world a better place in all he does. Luke was raised in Northern Idaho and attended the College of Idaho in Caldwell, graduating in 2004. Prior to becoming an attorney, Luke worked for the Office of the Governor as the Regional Director in Northern Idaho under former Governor Jim Risch. Luke also worked as the Executive Director of the Post Falls Urban Renewal Agency. Luke earned his Juris Doctorate from the University of Idaho College of Law in Moscow in 2010. 
He founded Smith Malik in 2015 with Peter J. Smith IV. And Luke represented North Idaho's District 4 in the Idaho legislature from 2012 to 2018. Welcome, Luke. We're so excited to have all three of you on today. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Kathy to kick us off with our questions. Great. Thank you, Kelly. And welcome to our three guests. Um, you know, today's focus is around policymaking and action. And so we have two former lawmakers from both sides of the political spectrum and Brian, who worked in the attorney general's office. And you know, Kelly and I are involved at the legislature. And so today's conversation is exciting because we are going to, you know, kind of peek behind the curtains around what it takes to do policymaking um, in general, what it looks like here in Idaho. And the three of you have a really great inside perspective, given your experience working in the Idaho State House. So I think as a sort of foundational question to get us started on this particular topic, you know, we're curious to know, and this is a question for all three of you, what did you think policymaking was going to look like once you started your careers in the political arena? And then how did it really look? Now, all three of you are out of the state house at this point. So, you know, what did it look like when you started? And then as you stepped out of the state house, you know, what did it look like in actuality? And why don't I start with Matt? He's at the top of my screen. Go ahead. Sure. Um, what I thought it was going to be was, um, much easier than it actually was, I think is probably the gist of it. The making policy is very hard. It's particularly hard if you're in the minority and it's rooted in your ability to build comprehensive, healthy relationships with um, members of the body and members of the other body, because you have to get it through both. And that takes time. So when you're coming from the minority, it can take a couple of years before you have enough relationships to build a coalition to pass legislation. And I think probably somebody who's a really good example right now is Senator Wintrow. She's um, been able to build a lot of coalitions to be able to advance policies, um, I think in difficult terrain and be able to pass things. It was, it was really difficult. Um, and at times you spoke to other people who were like-minded who couldn't go with you because maybe they had a perception that their district wouldn't support it or because a member of majority leadership told them that they couldn't do it. So you might lose people who you knew supported the policy that you were working on, but simultaneously were being pushed in the other direction by whatever external influence may have been a part of you know, their decision-making paradigm, whatever that was. So. I think anybody who thinks rolling into the legislature and passing legislation is easy is probably gone crack. Thank you for, for getting us started, Matt. Uh, why don't we uh, go to Brian next? Uh, thank you. So I think uh, to me, I think that if you, if you asked me what I thought when I first uh, showed up, I, I think that um, I was, I was probably tempered a little bit by my background in, in history and political science in, in college. And I thought that government policymaking would be much more proactive than reactive. It's, a, it's amazing to me how reactive at times government and even the legislature can be. That being said, like Idaho has actually had a great tradition of kind of proactive folks. Like I, I look, I, I think back to some of the vision that uh, former governor uh, Kempthorne had and the things that he saw unfolding and where the state should go. Uh, and he, he had some ideas that were unsuccessful, but now 20 years later, we can look back and be like, you know what, at the time that idea might've been ahead of its time, but if we had implemented it, the state would look somewhat different at this point in time. Um, and then I think about the stuff that's, that has worked, you know, if you think back to speakers, Newcomb, and Bedkey and the way that they have approached water uh, within Idaho. I mean, we're kind of a, a national leader in the way that our water system functions and how it's how it's put in place. And I think that to me, I thought that there would be a lot more what I call big idea, big thinking sorts of things within government. Like, what is it that we're going to look like as a state in five years or 10 years or 20 years and legislate to those outcomes? Uh, but really the reality is we tend to think in much shorter time horizons and and at times you know we 
we, we, we react to whatever the loudest voice is that's in our ear or standing in front of us. Uh, and I think that to me, how you strike the right balance between big ideas and reactive uh, government, that's the real trick of governing and policy making, because you absolutely have to think forward, but you also have to address constituent uh, concerns. And I think the balance there is maybe what I didn't have right uh, when I first started with the AG's office. And I think it's a, a balance that I don't know that you can ever get precisely right. It's a it's a reason for us to continue governing, I guess. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Brian. Luke, go for it. Thanks, Kathy. Um, good to see you. I, uh, you know, the, the example that pops into my mind is is one that I think, Kathy, you and I were on opposite sides of early in our careers, which is uh, I was trying to pass a bill that was the intent was to protect healthcare workers from from violent actors in, in their workplace. And uh, I, I learned several things through that bill, right, that I think uh, that really capture the heart of this question, which is how did you think it was going to work and and how did it actually work? And you know, what I didn't realize, you have to talk to 106 people um, if you want to get a bill passed, right? Because I got that bill initially through the through the House of Representatives and then almost through the Senate, although it was tied in the Senate. And I had not talked to the Lieutenant Governor, who at that point in time was our now Governor, Brad Little, um, and he didn't know anything about the bill because no one had talked to him. So he voted no to break the tie. So the bill went down in the Senate. So I learned a lot just through that experience alone. Um, but then also working on the on the opposite side of the ACLU on that one, right? I, I thought I had a real noble cause going into that conversation. And um, because my background was from the perspective of dealing with healthcare providers who were getting beaten and battered inside the inside the their workplaces. So the ER you know, being the main subject of that. So the bill made it a felony for someone to attack a healthcare worker. And um, and the other perspective that came to the table that became part of the debates later on after that bill was successful uh, the next year was how is this, how is this uh, impacting those who are mentally ill, right? Is this, is this a right way to be treating that? So. You know, you learn things aren't quite as black and white as as you think they are, even though you have a good idea. Um, are you really getting to the heart of, of the issue and, and solving an issue or creating more issues by the attempt that you're taking to that? I think it's one thing that the current legislature um, could really use some more of. What are the unintended consequences of, of the policies that just because you can get them through, should you be getting them through? Um, and I think there's a lot of impacts that we're going to be dealing with a long time from now because of the, the wretched policies that have been pushed through the legislature in the past few years, uh, to put it kindly. And um, yeah, I think that's that's the balance that, that you both talked about and, and just how difficult it is. I mean, there's a personal journey and there's the political journey, um, learning what you don't know and learning how to deal with other people who have really different opinions than you do and different worldviews and quite frankly, different motivations. Um, and that's all really difficult stuff to, to get around and, and it changes. I mean, it's a different place from when the, well, all four of us or five, how many of us are there's five of us on there now, all five of us were in the state house at the same time. Right. And it's a completely different place than, now than it was when we were there. So we learned a lot, but our knowledge in a lot of ways has become obsolete because the realities have changed so much inside that building. And that's another difficulty of the of the whole thing is it's constantly changing. What we thought what we thought were big fights back in the day when we were fighting over violence in the healthcare workplace are nothing compared to what um, a lot of those legislators are having to face now. Right. Great points, Luke. And I, and, um, I think it's, um, you know, one of the things I thought about when you were talking, because it is truly 106, even though you're one of the 105, so you don't have to talk to yourself, you still got like, to your point, um, the, the um, potential tiebreaker 
in the Senate side. And then you've also got the governor. I remember getting a bill through all the way through. And I, I mean, back and forth, working really hard with amendments and everything. Um, and hadn't looped in the governor to the extent I needed to. And, and it was vetoed. And that was heartbreaking. You know, you, like you said, you work so hard to get there. So great points. And like you said, the environment has changed dramatically. Um, let's start with you, Luke, um, on this one. And is there an issue that you wish you could redo, um, you know, having learned what you learned now? And yes, we know that environment's a little bit different today, but based on on what you've learned, is there a specific issue you wish you could go back and redo? And then Brian, in your case, when we get to you or change how you engaged on it, and if so, what would that look like for the three of you? Um, Luke, go ahead and start us off. Well, I'm gonna start kind of from a personal philosophy, right? I mean, you do the best you can with the knowledge that you have at whatever point in time that you have. So I don't, I don't tend to dwell on, on regrets, right? I will say that it's also a personal philosophy that I reserve the right to get smarter over time. So as I learn more, uh, there's things that I definitely wouldn't do again. Um, but, but part of my journey has been making those mistakes or learning some of those lessons the hard way. I think, you know, um, a couple that stand out to me was, was pretty heavy handed with stuff, right? I mean, it's, it is, it's very frustrating as we've been alluding to, to, to have to get that consensus. So it's tempting to just flex your muscle when you have the power. Um, and Matt's definitely been on the uh, receiving end of that, where it's like, we don't even get to have a debate over whether this is a good policy. You're just going to go ram it through. Um, so, so the extent that I've been involved in efforts like that, where, where, you know, just because we could, we did rather than stopping to measure whether or not we should. Um, I, I definitely don't view that as part of who I want to be in the future. So if I'm casting a vote for who Luke Malik is in the future, I won't be exercising that muscle. Great point. Love that. Matt, let's go to you and then we'll, we'll finish off with Brian on that question. Um, I was thinking about that question as you posed it to Luke, and one area is we passed a piece of legislation that gave first responders access to workers' compensation insurance for post-traumatic stress injuries. And in that process, um, we crafted it so narrowly so we could get it through the legislature that we cut out other public employees who see the same horrifying things on a regular basis. And now they're back in the legislature trying to add themselves to this legislation, but they don't have the same champions. They don't have the same people behind it. And so I think that the intent was great. We covered the dispatchers and the EMTs and the police and fire, but we neglected um, the county coroner and all the coroners who are public employees and see terrible things all the time. And we neglected a few other groups that are public employees that do really great things for people. Um, and, and we just didn't think about them or we thought about them and we decided not to move forward with them because maybe they didn't have the right constituency to get the votes taken care of and we didn't want to open it up too much. I think politically, I would have been more ruthless um, than I was. Uh, I think that at times the Democrats don't flex their muscle in a way that shows that they have relevancy down there. And I think that jamming the system up to point out some of the ridiculous bills that we're going through is absolutely essential. And there was often within the caucus a fear that we were going to get sideways with one of our constituencies or that people would be mad at us for killing an appropriation bill. When in fact, whenever we had the votes, we should have just killed everything and we should have greased that place up so bad that all the media could talk about is why we were doing that. So, and that's kind of a change because I was like, um, I wanted to make, I wanted to be uh, as bipartisan as possible. I would have continued to have been as bipartisan as possible, but I think that there's not enough light shined onto the body. And I think it's particularly true right now as the legislature has um, tried to ban books, tried to ban people, tried to ban everything. And the, the whole, we love the local government kind of charade or myth 
is kind of painful to watch and sit on the sidelines. And I think that there's a reason that a minority party is the opposition party and they should view themselves as the opposition party and be a bit more aggressive. Great point. Thank you, Matt. Brian. You're muted, Brian. Sorry about that. Uh, I think to start off, uh, if there's one thing uh, I'd like to redo, it's the decision to take 16 North. Like if we could redo that and just do it, um, but 20 years ago, that would be really good for the state. Um, but seriously, I think that um, to me, the, the issue that I would love to have the opportunity to kind of re-engage on is an issue that I inherited, uh, that, that the AG's office inherited, um, and we actually litigated it. But, it, and by the time it got to us, it was in a spot where it was essentially a third rail within state government, and that's uh, tribal gaming. Um, there was a deal that was worked out a long time ago on tribal gaming. It went down uh, because it wasn't approved in the Senate, which then resulted in an init initiative that was then challenged. Um, the, the dilemma, though, is that in doing it in that fashion, it created kind of a third rail of policymaking within the legislature, where anytime you wanted to touch anything related to gaming, it was almost impossible to get anywhere on it. And so in my office, I used to field constant calls from like charities and stuff that were like, hey, can we have a duck race? Can we do a raffle? Can we do, you know, a fundraiser casino night? Uh, and and it put the it puts it puts the the policy on those things in a really precarious case because the laws all say one thing but i'm not sure that that's what everybody is actually following at this point in time and so like the actual practice of the people has outpaced where the law is but it's really hard right now to sit down and have an intelligent productive conversation on that because a lot of the interests in those areas are very galvanized. Uh, and I think that to me, that's something that continues to be a problem, although it's a little bit of a subsurface problem in Idaho. But I think it's a pro it's not a problem because people essentially decide, well, we don't want to deal with it. And I don't know that that's the best spot to either govern or to make policy from. And so I think that that's a good example of an issue that if there were a reset button, we could sure use it. Great. Well, thank you, Brian and Luke and Matt for those answers. You know, I'm going to transition us now to a topic around engaging stakeholders, which is something kind of Luke alluded to. And we got, <laughs> yes, we did get to work on opposing ends of probably many, many issues um, during our time at the legislature together. But in thinking back, right, like not only do you have your colleagues, like your fellow elected officials, right, but you have a number of stakeholders who are engaged at the state house. You have advocacy group, you have members of the public, you have other state agencies, you have lobbyists, private business interests. So in thinking about all the different folks who are in the building, talking to lawmakers, helping craft policy, you know, this is a multi-part question. So I'll say it once and then I can repeat if needed. What are the best practices for engaging stakeholders when you're collaborating to put together thoughtful solutions or policies? And then what tips do you have for better engagement with policymakers? So your, your own colleagues yourselves. And if there's um, an issue that you can think of or an example that helps illustrate your thoughts on that, we'd love to hear it. And again, to repeat, because it's kind of a, a three-part question, um, what best practices do you have for engaging stakeholders? Uh, and then what tips do you have for better engagement with policymakers? And if there's an example you have, um, We'd love to hear it. Maybe we'll start with you, Brian, and then we'll work down to Luke and then Matt. So to me, I think that, you know, one of the one of the best pieces of advice I can offer for identifying stakeholders is when you put together an issue. Um, one of the first questions questions I always like to ask is, OK, who's going to oppose this? And then once I know who's going to oppose it, it allows for working backwards from there. And then one of the other things I like to do with each group that we talk to, I would always ask the group, who else should we be talking to? Like, who else do we know that should be that would be interested in this or should be interested in this? 
and then kind of build out from there. Um, and, and I think the other thing, you know, that I would recommend, I know that government at times, it feels people like government to be cloak and dagger, but cloak and dagger has a weird tendency to jump up and sting you. Uh, like when you run over the yellow jacket nest when you're mowing your lawn. And I think that to me, some of these things, especially if you know it's it's going to get a lot of attention, you know, get it out early and have that discussion and make sure you know what the opposition is going to be, where the points of agreement are, where the points of disagreement are. And one of the things that has come up to me over and over in the stakeholder process is even on pieces of legislation with very, very dedicated opposition, there's often broad swaths of the legislation that you actually all agree on. Uh, and one of the things that I always wonder about is, you know, is there a path forward based on the fact that we agree on 80 percent and disagree on 20 percent? And to me, that's all part of bringing the stakeholders in and, and helping them identify that. Great. Thank you. I like kind of that piece around sort of transparency and, you know, early engagement, which I think does really benefit a more thoughtful kind of policymaking process. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Luke, go ahead. Thanks, Kathy. I, I think I've got uh, a really good example um, and it's kind of a success story, which is probably eight years ago, LK Shaw Tulloch with the uh, the Department of Health and Welfare reached out and said, we've got a problem with um, surrogacy in the state of Idaho. And she says, we've got, we've got judges pitted against um, women who are acting as uh, surrogates for couples that can't have babies. Um, and we've got um, another sector where people are kind of making a business out of this and then forum shopping to figure out what county they think they can get the best judging and and there's no laws in the state of Idaho governing surrogacy there we're we're kind of cobbling together abortion or I'm sorry adoption law uh, in order to in order to make this work and it's being inconsistently applied across the state and so uh, in terms of getting stakeholders together um, we got the courts and women who owned surrogacy businesses including acting as surrogates themselves and the Department of Health and Welfare and legislators. Some of you may, may remember uh, Lynn Luker, who was the chairman of the of the Judiciary and Rules Committee back in the day and loved to have an impact on every aspect of that bill, uh, any bill that went through his committee. Um, and we probably, we probably put several hundred hours into drafting a bill. Um, and at the end of the day, we, uh, Bart Davis, who was the majority leader in the, in the Senate, uh, decided not to give that bill a hearing because it was just there was just too much going on the implications around debates around human trafficking and um, all all of the issues that come up with surrogacy a drawer went in or that bill went into his drawer and never saw the light of day um, well i got a call from the drafter uh in the legislative services office um, at the end of the session he said you're not going to believe this but that bill passed unanimously um, out of the House and a, a huge majority of the Senate with no debate on either side and no changes to the bill as you had drafted it seven years ago. Um, and um, all those stakeholders come back to the table and said, we need, we really need to fix this problem. The courts uh, knew they needed to fix the problem and, um, and, and it all came to be. So there was examples of stakeholders across a broad spectrum with really diverse viewpoints and, and including bringing other policymakers into that debate as well and ended up with a great outcome. I think we've got a great law in the books now. I say it's part of one of the drafters, but um, but I think, you know, it's an example of success. And, and because of that, there's going to be a lot of people who have a lot more security in terms of how they're going to grow their families here in the state of Idaho. Thanks, Luke. And congratulations. That was a long game for successful policymaking, but you did it. Yeah. And bipartisan, too. It was a Democrat that picked up the bill and ran with it and got it passed unanimously through the House and almost there voted bill on the Senate side. A win's a win. <laughs> go yeah. for it, Matt. Uh, you know, I think what Brian said in particular about stakeholder engagement is really key. Sometimes someone will bring you a, an issue that feels very myopic and might 
on its surface appear to only be beneficial to somebody in your district. So for example, and this is a strange one, but a bill was brought to me or an issue was brought to me by the Egyptian theater in Boise. And their issue was they wanted to be able to sell beer and wine at the Egyptian theater. Um, well, for those of you that know, um, Idaho doesn't really want beer and wine sold inside of movie theaters. So we had to figure out like, why is the Egyptian different? And who else in the state might be willing to jump on that bandwagon? And over time, what we figured out was there were about 25 theaters that were listed on the National Historic Registry, and they were all listed in different districts. And in doing so, we were able to craft a piece of legislation that covered only theaters that were on the National Historic Registry and that we were able to then build a coalition across all stakeholders, including traditional groups that you would think would oppose drinking beer or wine inside of a theater, whether that be religious groups or other groups. And um, I know that that bill seems so like superficial because people are like, who the hell cares if you, you know, have a beer in a theater? But what it did was, in many cases, it gave those theaters a new line of revenue to actually keep them in business. And those historic theaters are very central to a lot of the small towns in Idaho. But it took almost two years to pass that thing. But once we finally got it passed, it was pretty much unanimous across the board. Very few people voted against it. My point is that um, a lot of times when you're representing your specific district, someone will bring you something that appears to be myopic. But more often than not, it might be a reflection of what's happening in the state more broadly. And being able to zoom that issue out and bring in other stakeholders, including other legislators as co-sponsors on the legislation, is a trick that I think takes legislators a lot of time to fully develop and build out. Um, because we often are, we have a sense we're elected to vote just our constituents. And I think that um, we really represent all of Idaho. And when we can find commonalities across multiple districts, we have a better chance of actually passing legislation that will help the entire state. Wonderful. I couldn't agree more. I um, I learned the hard way. Um, coming back to Brian's or yeah to Brian's comment about you know who doesn't like it, right? Because I I remember as a legislator early on, people would come and they would bring an idea that I thought was great, and I would say, oh yeah, sure, that sounds great. I think I could be supportive of that and and hopefully be helpful there. And then not too long after someone come in the office and say, you know, if you do that, that's gonna do this to us, or it's gonna harm us this way, or it's gonna, you know, have these consequences. And I'd be like, oh, wait, time out, right? So that was a question I learned the hard way to start asking initially um, when people would bring me ideas is, okay, I understand why you're wanting to solve this problem that we have, but who doesn't like it and why? So that I could then seek that out and better understand. I still may have gone with that first, um, person that came into the office, but at least now I had a better understanding and could make an informed decision. So let's build on that question. And Matt, we're going to start with you. What is the cost of not collaborating, right? In, in, in not engaging those stakeholders and, and asking those tough questions from the beginning? Well, I can only speak to the minority's perspective um, on this, but I will tell you that the legislature is about very, very basic math. In the House, you need 36 votes to pass anything. And if you don't have 36 votes, then you can't pass it. And in addition to that, you need between eight and nine votes just to get it out of committee. And so if you're not willing to collaborate with folks and give them say in what you're working on, particularly coming from the minority, then you either have a bill that's a total slam dunk that, that anybody is gonna support, or you don't have a bill at all. And I think that it's really important that when we look at how to advance legislation collaboratively, that we keep an open mind and we develop a reputation inside of the building as being someone who um, creates authentic relationships that values the people that we're working with, even when we disagree with them, or even if we just like viscerally disagree with them on virtually everything, the clock's right twice a day. And so finding those ways to be collaborative is really key if you wanna get anything done in there. 
And so that doesn't just mean um, collaborating with your House members. It means collaborating with members of the Senate, finding people who will champion legislation in the Senate. Sometimes it means working with the AG's office to get um, to ask the right question. The AG's office was a really interesting piece to this whole process because if you were seeking guidance on a piece of legislation and you didn't ask the right questions, you might not get answers that had any value. So you had to be really thoughtful in how you crafted those questions. And so sometimes it was a matter of going into Brian's office or uh, Attorney General Wazen's office at the time and, and really trying to drill down on what we were looking for to try to get answers to questions that would be beneficial to the process. So, and if you can't just walk into, you know, Mr. Kane's office because he thinks you're Jojo the Idiot Circus Boy, then you, you lose a tool that's available to you as a legislator because they serve as your, as your representative. So being able to collaborate not only with the AG's office, but having a relationship in the Secretary of State's office, and then most importantly to Kelly, to your point, being able to have good, strong quality relationships in the governor's office so that you know where things are at if it does finally get to the governor's desk, that matters as well. So it's, if you can't collaborate, then the future of your bill is dim. Absolutely. Great point. Do we have, Matt. Do we have somebody taking notes? Do we have somebody taking notes so that we have, we have a list of all these quips that, that Matt has? Jo Jojo the Circus Boy? <laughs> Well, I believe this is archived, so we're going to have it on video for a okay, while. Perfect. So. I love it. Why don't you take off and then we'll turn to, to Brian. Go ahead, Liz. Well, I think, you know, the, the cost, um, we have, legislators have a tremendous amount of responsibility on them. If they wield that responsibility uh, incorrectly, there's a, there's a cost to, to, I mean, the ultimate cost is, is human life, right? I mean, I think uh, policy regarding abortion right now in the state of Idaho is the perfect example. I mean, we are literally running physicians out of the state if they don't think there's going to be a human cost to that, including costing people's lives. When a physician has to look at a at a case that they're medically trained to um, to deal with and say, "Wait, am I gonna am I gonna face prison or or or?" civil ramifications five years down the road for making a medically necessary call. Um, and, and then the choice is it's kind of either me or them. I can, I can, I can let them kind of figure this out on their own um, and avoid going to prison or avoid being sued five years down the road. Um, or I can put everything on the line to give them the training that my, my medical, <laughs> You know the the advice that my medical training says that I should give them. I mean, that is a that is an atrocious, unacceptable, and and quite frankly evil outcome from people tripping over themselves to make a name over policy that is that is truly bad for Idahoans. And um, and I mean it's it's absolutely shameful. So that's the cost. I mean, you're literally putting people's lives in danger by not understanding. The impacts of the policy that you're passing. I think that's a really good point. In fact, I thought a lot about this um, past legislative session and some of the the bills that were passed that, you know, were unconstitutional. Which I think is why it's great that we're going to turn to to Brian next because you're right. There is that ultimate cost of potentially life, you know, um, or harm to people. There's a, a real judicial, I believe, cost um, to some of this as well. So, Brian, how about you? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, obviously when, when you bring constitutionality or legality into play, there's a financial cost in term and, and, a, and a government resources cost, right? Because you've got to devote resources and dollars to defending um, whatever the policy is that's been enacted. And I think that you can measure that. The, the other, I mean, there's two other very significant things that flow from not involving stakeholders. One, which was touched on by Luke and Matt to some degree, is unintended consequences, right? We know how this is going to impact this group of stakeholders. There may be a group of stakeholders that we didn't even realize this was going to impact. And how is it going to impact them? And is that what we're even shooting for? Like, do we mean for it to affect this group in this way with this outcome? And, and if you don't involve them, 
then you don't learn about that until it's too late. And, you know, with a part time legislature, you put a law into effect. Well, we don't get another bite at that apple uh, for at least eight months. And usually it's a little bit longer once you think through the process, like even the bills that that uh, have had huge agreement, like we're going to do this bill first off out of the gate. You're still a good two weeks uh, in, in getting it through and, and, and passed and signed and all of that sort of stuff. So those are two. The third one, and I think that this is one that we sometimes overlook, but we really shouldn't be, is what is the impact on our confidence in our government? If we start passing legislation and we're not involving stakeholders, we take a hit to the confidence in our own ability and system of governance. And I think that to me, that's one of the things that we have to always keep in mind is that this is a government of the people, by the people, but we only have it as long as we have the confidence of the people. And sometimes we forget about that element. You know, folks, folks understand they're not going to win every single issue, but they do expect to be treated fairly through the process, right? If I show up to a committee hearing to voice my opposition to this, I hope somebody's listening and I get a chance to speak. When we short circuit those sorts of, of elements within our own process, that has a destructive effect on the confidence that we have within our own governance. And that's not something that's sustainable. Uh, one of the more frequent uh, questions that I fielded in the AG's office from the very first day I started until literally the day that I turned out the lights was, my government won't listen to me. What is my recourse with a government that won't listen, right? The judicial system is rigged, right? The legal system is rigged. The legislative system is rigged, right? These aren't novel statements. There's nothing new in any of this. But I think that anyone in government has a responsibility to take those statements seriously and address them so that we don't continue to undermine our own effectiveness. Brian, I just want to say I so deeply appreciate you saying that piece as in my previous role, spend a lot of time working to bring members of the public to the state house to engage on really difficult, contentious issues. And so many times I had to work to debunk there. It doesn't matter, Kathy, I'm going to go there and it won't matter. And, and having to really remind folks that even if we don't get the outcome we want a committee hearing or on a floor vote, you know, your presence and engagement, just having lawmakers see you in the building meant something right, that they know that the public is watching, that they do care about the votes lawmakers are taking. And I do hope that ultimately, you know, lawmakers moving forward recognize there's real value in hearing the multitude of voices from members of the public, whether they agree with you or not, um, that the process is just improved for everybody involved when those opportunities are given. And, and people feel like you're going to a committee hearing and you're testifying and people are scared. They don't like public speaking. They're on a microphone. You can see your face on the screen now because they're doing everything virtual. Um, but you ultimately just want a lawmaker to be like, thank you for coming here. And that was a, a consideration I hadn't thought of before. And I'm going to factor that into my decision moving forward. So I just want to say that's been a big part of my professional career. And I'm really happy you said that because I do think it speaks. There are a lot of folks across the state who, who hold on to that piece as well. So transitioning us now, and we've all kind of hinted around this a little bit too, but how can additional collaboration amongst all the, all the partners um, help maintain the proper balance between each branch of government, right? We've talked a little bit about your role, Brian, and you're in the AG's office, but certainly sit in the legal branch or the um, judicial branch of government. You have the governor's office, agencies in the executive branch, and then, you know, lawmakers in the legislative branch. So um, I'm Matt's at the top of my screen now. So I'm going to pick on Matt again. Maybe we'll get a funny name out of his answer. I certainly hope so. Um, but Matt, like your thoughts there on how collaboration helps kind of bring the three branches together for better policymaking. I haven't thought of that question, but better collaboration um, in general will pull a piece of legislation out of the fringes, whether that be the far right or the far left and into the middle. And if you can pull something into the middle through better engagement, through stakeholders, through understanding the issue, through 
working through all of the challenges that are there and you have the patience for that, then what you are likely to have as your end result is a piece of legislation that's upheld in the courts, that's supported by the executive branch, and then frankly can be administered um, effectively through administrative rulemaking and all of the processes that take place after we pass the legislation. And so um, one of the challenges that we have in this highly polarized time is that we tend to objectify the other side and we objectify the other side in order to um, not have to hear their, their version of the argument or not have to uh, respect it as being a valid point. And so the purpose, like when Kelly and Luke and I first got together over Chinese food in uh, sometime in 2020 to talk about this was look at what's happening. We are polarizing and through this polarization, we're seeing a constitutional defense fund that's basically a revolving door for the legislature to defend itself. We're seeing the Supreme Court pushing back on the legislature because it's self-isolated itself and passes laws that don't make any sense. So what we know is that when we engage multiple stakeholders, we work in a collaborative manner and we're actually able to pull legislation into the middle, we get quality legislation that passes the test of time, that is straightforwardly administered by the government and that is supported by the different branches. And that's what we should be shooting for. Um, you know, I guess the, the last piece I'll add there is I forgot the federal government like this whole transporting a person across state lines is now a felony. Like, okay, that's going to be an expensive case to defend. And now we're regulating what people can do when they're in another state. So it, the, the idea that we're going to ignore the U S constitution because it doesn't fit our framework is problematic. The idea that we're going to ignore one of the branches of government, you know, I've always just been of the opinion that, and Brian said it in his opening statement, the more transparent we are, the more opportunity we provide for stakeholders to engage. And in doing so, we uncover unintended problems when we're passing legislation. I didn't say anything funny there, but just, just was so bought into what I was saying. <laughs> Well, thanks, Matt. I think the federal government piece is a, an important one that we forgot to mention, but certainly the legislature has a federalism committee and those conversations do come up quite a bit around what are their viewpoints on what the federal government does and how that interplays with state policymaking. Um, let's go to Brian and then we can go to Luke to close out this question. To me, I think that this, um, you know, the why we need that, why we should encourage kind of collaboration. It comes back to uh, one of the, the overarching premises, and that's that the states are the laboratories of democracy. And I think that if we're going to be the laboratory, then we have to be willing to continue to probe and test and, and seek out what the different alternatives are, what the solutions are, who's interested in what and why. Um, I think that at times we've got a couple of obstacles to collaboration that we do have to address. Uh, I know that one of the reasons for why the, the legislature at times is apprehensive about sharing legislation early is because they're gonna get pounded for it in the media. And if you take a pounding in the media, at times that will forestall further discussion of something. People are like, look, I'm not even gonna try to, try to summit that hill if I'm just gonna take all the arrows for it. And so I think that sometimes you know, the media's zest to get a, a, a story and to pound on somebody for a bad idea. You know, all, every idea starts out bad at some point. You got to get to a point where it starts to make sense. And so I think that sometimes this discussion gets foreclosed um, because of how eager we are at times to get things out there and to say yay or nay on them, um, which then gets to the second element that I think is an obstacle to collaboration. And that is, we have an urge to distill things down to binary decisions, right? It's either a yes or no decision. And, you know, we can go all the way back to George Washington's admonition about political parties and that political parties probably aren't the best thing if we want an open, free Republican democracy um, because of the way that they have a tendency to distill things into yes or no issues. And you're looking at that kind of play out nationally that we, instead of us having a full open discussion of ideas and governance and what's best for our nation or our state, 
we have a series of litmus tests. Are you for us or are you against us? It's not, does this make sense for how we want to govern our nation and where we want to go as a nation or a state? So I think that that's one of the, the other elements that's an obstacle. And then the last element that's an obstacle to collaboration that I really think we need to, to think through and talk about is, um, and, and I loved that um, Matt uh, highlighted this, but you know, you get these, you get, you get the branches and they love to build a fence around their branch. The question though is, does the fence around your branch advance the policy and governance of the state or the nation? And there are a lot of times where we're so eager to build a fence that we then forget, oh wait, we've still got to govern. And I think that that's something that comes up over and over again in government is you get people that are in positions and then they take positions, but at some point government still has to govern folks, right? We still need to get the road fixed. Um, regardless, you can be as mad as you want about how expensive the road is, we still have to have it. And I think that that's something that oftentimes uh, gets lost in these discussions and why, you know, when you're thinking through collaboration, there are little things that become huge obstacles to that collaboration. Well said, Brian. Thank you. Go ahead, Luke. Yeah, I, I agree with with both of my fellow panelists. And, you know, there's, there's a natural tension in having three co-equal branches of government. Um, but when you get people who don't um, respect that they are co-equal branches of government in power, um, that tension spills over into something more like hatred and disdain um, and knocks that out of balance. I mean, there's there's one thing is saying, I don't agree with the way the courts are looking at this, or I don't agree with the fact that the governor vetoed that bill. But when it when you start to say, because I don't agree, there shouldn't be that balance of power. And so we're going to make the legislative branch more powerful because it's more important because we're the only one that re truly represents the people. That, that, that tension spills over to disdain, which is a terrible thing for our form of government. Um, and you've seen that open um, disdain uh, spouted by legislators who are currently serving and saying that, you know, we are going to make the legislature more powerful than the courts. We're going to make the legislature more powerful than the executive branch um, because we believe that we're more important. We're the best form of government and and the three branches are not co-equal um, and, and the outcome becomes tyranny. I mean, that's what happens. You, power is corruptive. That's why we need those three co-equal branches so that they can, they can create a balance. And if power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And the legislature is not immune to that. And the impacts, uh, again, are, are wide, widespread because of that lack of respect for that very basic principle of our form of government. Great, great responses from everyone. Thank you so much. We've got just one last question for you and, and, and we'll wrap up our show. Appreciate all of the insight and all of the great um, examples and just the real realness that has been part of today's panel. I really appreciate it. It's been a good conversation. So let's end on this. What can all of us do? What can constituents do to encourage collaboration and help create an atmosphere where civility and collaboration is the expectation? where it's the norm um, rather than maybe the world that we're, we find ourselves in it um, at this time. Um, let's, let's start with you, Brian, and then we'll go to Matt and finish up with Luke. So I think, I mean, to me, if I were to answer the question of what can we do to, um, you know, ensure collaboration and, and civility within the process, I think that, that there are a couple of things that, that I would recommend. Um, one of them, you know, I, I, I've got two kids and one of the things that has struck me is in reading the children's books to my kids, uh, I realized that a lot of children's books are actually for adults um, and they've got really important messages that maybe we don't think through and remind ourselves of enough. Uh, and one of the children's books that kind of really sticks out to me over and over again as I've operated in this space is, it, it's not a book, it's a story, but it's The Emperor's New Clothes. And I think that to me, one of the more uh, 
difficult things to, to think through is the dangers of groupthink. Meaning when you surround yourselves with all people who think the same thing, the things that come out of that scenario are not always good for the republic. And I think that that's one of the areas where, you know, if you remember the emperor's new clothes, like everybody was telling the emperor that he looked great. Um, and it was only an outgroup person that was like, hey, that guy's naked. And I think that that's one of the things like if we really want to keep this republic, as Ben Franklin admonished us to, we have to be more open to finding folks from an opposite point of view and sitting down and having that conversation. I think we also have to understand that if we agree on 90 percent of things, that's probably not an enemy. It's more like a friend. Um, but somehow we've cast ourselves at this historical moment to where those those little things that seem obvious are not so obvious. And then the obvious things, for whatever reason, we're afraid to point out or call out uh, because of the ramifications of our in-group uh, messaging. And so I think that to me, like the thing we really need to do is we need to get outside of our comfort groups and engage thoughtfully with other folks. And I think that, I mean, to me, some of that engagement has to occur outside of the state house. I will tell you, I have very different conversations in my office versus at Dawson Taylor or Java or Flying M. And that's the other thing is like, we don't have to do everything formally in a suit and tie sitting across a desk. There's lots of grass and, and creeks that we can get a lot of work and in, in conversation done. And so I think those are, those are the things that I would recommend. Love it. Great points. Matt, how about you? I would agree with with Brian when I was in the legislature, just because of the role I had, I did town halls all over the state, not just in my district. And in um, doing so, I had a lot of folks who were there to film me and I wouldn't say they were friendlies. And in doing so, I learned a lot from other perspectives, both regionally and in terms of partisan politics. I thought Brian was gonna say, um, give a mouse a cookie as the childhood fable. Um, and I'm glad he didn't because I think it teaches children not to share. And I think that um, we should continue to share our ideas, our thoughts, and ensconce ourselves with people who maybe don't see the world the same as we do. And I think social media has been a detriment to that. It creates an internal echo chamber. Um, and it also creates an environment where people get some weird flawed external validation for something that they've said or done. And I think those real conversations at Dawson, at Java, at Flying M um, are important and that interaction was lost a little bit during COVID and we should get back to that if we wanna depolarize our society. Absolutely, I agree. Luke. I also did a lot of town halls. In fact, I think I did more town halls than any other legislator during our time. It was Man, you are lying. Re critical re-election effort. And uh, I do remember Matt coming into my district with a camera to take take video for <laughs> uh, to help unseat me and get a Democrat into my seat. But um, but I do think I agree that that that, that, that it, there's no substitute for that face-to-face -face contact. The more we dehumanize each other, the less successful we'll be in this. Great. Well, thank you to our wonderful guests today. I feel like this has been one of my favorite um, topics we've had since I've joined this podcast. And it's been really great getting to reconnect with Luke, with Matt and with Brian, who really were tremendous partners to work with at the state house, even when we were on opposing ends of the spectrum, or sometimes I had to come in and maybe threaten a lawsuit or something from my from my former employer. Um, but all that to say, um, thank you to our panelists for joining us today and for giving up part of their lunch hour to have this conversation. And really, I thank you to everyone who's out there in the 
virtual world watching and tuning into today's conversation. I also want to thank the Association of Idaho Cities and the Boise Metro Chamber, along again with our media partners, Idaho Ed News, the Statesman, the Idaho Press, and Idaho Capital Sun. And of course, a big thank you to our presenting partner, our presenting sponsor, excuse me, Holly Troxell, attorneys and counselors. And we'll be back again next month. I won't be here, but you'll have a great substitute from, um, from the city here. And we'll be back during the lunch hour on June 12th um, for another discussion. And we look forward to seeing you all then. Hope everyone has a great rest of your Monday. Thank you.